Um, right, so this is GraphQL meets Drupal. I know this was supposed to be a workshop for, of three hours, or three and a half hours, actually. Uh, due to some client, person client work, we couldn't uh, prepare that for this week. So instead, we now have a session. Um, and I'm Sebastian, or the Fubi on Twitter and on Drupal.org. And right, so let's get started with the session. Um, today, we'll talk about uh, the mot motivations behind GraphQL, why Facebook invented it in the first place, and what the benefits of other solutions for specific problems are. And uh, we'll look at some GraphQL examples, live demo, um, both in Drupal and outside of Drupal, to show some of the features that are not yet supported inside of the Drupal module and maybe inside of the PHP libraries as a whole. And um, we will look at some extended features that I'm looking into bringing into the module and also into the PHP world around GraphQL, uh, if there's time at the end. Right. So the motivations of GraphQL, aka the limitations of REST, um, in today's world, in today's world of the modern web, applications grow massively and really quickly, and the data requirements also grow. And with that comes the problem that REST runs into limitations um, in terms of well, the possibilities for, for fetching that data in a structured way. Um, and you've heard of these problems um, before, I guess. So these are quite quite famous already. Uh, everyone has been talking about them for a while now. Um, so we have, first of all, I've got the problem overfetching. Overfetching is when you receive a lot of information from a resource that you don't require. Information that just comes because this, the, the information that the server provides is dictated by the server, and the client has no way of um, telling the server explicitly what it requires. And so we've got overfetching. This is critical for large-scale applications, uh, for example, for, uh, for Facebook. Um, fetching the entire news feed through a generic resource across all of the different applications with different requirements might cause actually quite some overhead in the HTTP payload. Um, or additional requirements on the JavaScript or Android code for proce processing that data. And then we have got underfetching. Underfetching is the problem of uh, a breaking API change. Um, for example, you, uh, you want to um, call a resource and fetch the title and the body field, but then at some point, the developer in the backend decides, okay, um, I don't see why there's like this, uh, why this title field is in this payload. Let's remove it. And then at some point, your one of your application breaks. And this is a very real problem, especially if you're dealing with multiple different types of applications on, these, on the same backend. Android iOS app, Android developers fiddling with the backend, changing something specifically for the Android application, breaking the iOS application. Um, multiple round trips. You, you might have seen Angular applications in the past where you are calling REST resources, <coughs> Um, for, for, for reference data. So the first request to the server returns you all of the information about the articles that you want to list. But there's only references to the authors inside of that. There's no data about the authors, not the, the title or the name of the author and maybe the email address that you want to render. So you have to do another round trip to the server to get that information as well. And that looks really awkward in your application. It makes the application stutter as it renders on the front page, uh, as it renders on your page, and the information drips into into the uh, client-side code. Um, and then there's also the problem of versioning. So there's no clear definition of what API versioning should look like in um, traditional REST. So people come up with, all of, with, set, with custom solutions on their own, uh, a lot of different solutions. And um, the problem with versioning in REST is also that there's no, because there's no clear specification, there's also no standardization around how to implement it in the back end. So, um, you might run into a pro the problem of complications, uh, of, of complex and, and tedious um, um, maintenance burdens when you have to maintain multiple different versions of your API in the long run. Um, this is actually quite interesting for Facebook because they have no deprecated version of any of their apps. Um, so Facebook is running um, iOS and Android apps that are like five years old and they still work because they are using the same APIs. Okay, let's look at some examples. Um, assume you want to fetch um, data from a Star Wars API, um, and you want to render 
uh, the names of all of the people that appeared in any of the Star Wars movies. You want to render the list of movies that they appeared in, and you want to render the name of the planet of the of the home planet. So that's all of the information you want. And in an ideal world, you would only get that that data back from your REST resources. But in reality, this is what it looks like in traditional REST. So you call a resource, and you get all of the data back that is associated with that data object, with that model, right? Um, and because we have references in REST, and that's kind of how it's implemented in the standard fashion, um, all the information you get about the movies that they are in is the URL at which you can fetch that data, right? Um, so what do you need? What you need to do is uh, this is this is called overfetching, right? Sorry. So this is what overfetching probably looks like. And um, so if you want to fetch the name of the planet, you have to get the full object again. You make another round trip to the server, and this is additional round trips. So you go again to the server and get all of that stuff again. Again, overfetching, really tedious. So and because we have a list of associated movies, we have to do many, many, many round trips back to the server to fetch all the films and all the information about the films. We could obvi obviously fetch um, or implement a custom resource where we can fetch multiple films at once, but still, another round trip is always required. So you might think, hey, um, we don't need a new custom approach to this at all. We can just fix this with custom URLs, with custom resources. And you might think, um, this is clever, right? So hey, let's just fix this and add a custom resource that has um, some custom get parameter where you can specify uh, additional fields that you want to fetch from custom resources, right? Um, or you might want to implement this. Whoop. Um, or that, right? And if you have had to deal with this situation before, you might be in tears now, because this is really not what you want to do. Because what it, ends to, what it, what it leads to is a very complex application that becomes more and more complex for maintenance uh, over time. And at some point, it's, you don't know what's going on. And you might even have dead resources at some point, because you have no clue what you can actually delete, what is still in use, and so on. So um, you end up with endpoints galore, and uh, this is really not where you want to be. And then imagine, now you have a versioned API, where you have to maintain all of these additional resources in different, you know, in different shapes. Um, so, we're really close to the first demo now. How does it look with the knife? <laughs> okay, so that's really good timing. Right. Um, yeah, I can just keep talking. <laughs> and you, you can maybe try? Throw. Um, so slides, if they go away. Um, and what I find interesting to discuss when we are talking about this is, why do, we, uh, why do we treat our data that we fetch over HTTP in the same way that we are treating our data in, in a SQL database? So we have join tables, right? So when you fetch related this data, you, f you do join tables. Why do we think of that in the same way when we, when we talk about HTTP APIs? It makes no real sense because um, in order to retrieve that information, we are kind of um, um, compiling the data uh, when we send it over the wire to then expand it again on the client. Instead of like we are we are we are, we are somehow cha um, um, sending the data in different ways than we would actually need them on the client. Um, there would have to be another display there if it would work. Yeah, very often at other conferences. <laughs> well, so here's the idea. Um, I already scheduled the buff for 13 uh, for for 1:30 p.m. 
Uh, we can do the Drupal demo there. Uh, I can do the live demo for GraphQL on one of the hosted GraphQL demo servers on the web. And you can also open that on your browsers if you want to. Um, sorry? Oh, I don't know this. Like, actually, where, where should we meet? Maybe just as outside of this room after this presentation and we find a room together. Right, OK. Adapters between, yeah. 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 <laughs> so the only problem is that we have to switch like between slides and demo now. It's it's fine though. So no, it's fine. Um, no, no. Um, if, yeah, if you can put this on the back again. You have to f maybe switch again. Yeah. So, right, in, in, in REST, we're kind of modeling the data, compiling it, then sending it over the wire, expanding it again on the client by doing these round trips and fetching the additional information instead of exposing that explicitly um, wholesale. So, Increase the size of this of the text here. Yeah. So wouldn't it be great if instead German keyboard? <coughs> why does anyone have a German keyboard? Oh, there we go. So wouldn't it be great if I could just sell? Give me all of the people, and then for all of the people, give me their name. Give me their home planet and also all of the films that they are in. And for each of the films, I just need the title. Right. Uh. <laughs> this. This is uh, GraphQL, what you're looking at right now. Um, actually, the interface that you're looking at is called Graphical. It allows you to run test queries and write them with type aheads and some auto completion and uh, uh, syntax checks. Um, and this is, I think, the natural way of fetching hierarchical data over HTTP for rich client-side applications that have complex data requirements. Um, right. So let's go back to the slides. So yay, that's really great. Um, it's, yeah, it's called GraphQL. And how does this work? So GraphQL, is, at its core, is um, not a specific implementation of anything. It is, it is not a graph database that you're querying directly. Um, essentially, it's, it's just a language specification, uh, a syntax that you can implement in any language, for any programming language. And there's already a couple of uh, very interesting implementations in all sorts of different languages. We have, the, we have one in PHP, most importantly for us, right? Um, and we have Python implementations, Ruby, C, actually. So you can have a C library that you can implement, uh, include anywhere, really. Um, uh, we have uh, um, uh, Elixir, everything, really. Um, <laughs> And right, it's, it's a data querying language, specification of a language. And it, what's really important is it runs on arbitrary code. So you're not accessing a database directly through GraphQL. Instead, you are basically 
invo invoking functions over HTTP, and those functions are resolved on the server by your arbitrary code. So, for example, in Drupal, you'd have the entity manager loading the storage layer and then fetching entities, right? Um, processing them somehow in that resolver function of GraphQL and returning the values that you are exposing through your GraphQL schema. So there we are, schema. Um, each GraphQL server running a library that enables GraphQL syntax um, is backed by a schema and a type system. And the schema basically publishes the possibilities that the server has for providing you with information, providing you with data. And it does so by um, you building an, a, a hierarchy of type information with resolver functions. And it then, like when you send the query to the server, it, it, it calls these resolver functions sequentially in that hierarchy that the query is structured to fetch information. So for example, you are loading, as the first step, you are loading an entity because you're going through, uh, you want to load node one, right? And then that loads the node object, node one. And then you only fetch the title field. So the next layer in that graph retrieves, uh, receives the node object as an argument to the resolver function. And it knows it just wants to fetch the title, so it, it, it runs node get title, basically. And that's all of the magic behind it, right? So it's just a hierarchy of types. Um, and why is that also really important? Because through that graph, you get a standardized way of loading uh, these type definitions also on the client or anywhere else, really. So you can have tooling, because we, we call this introspection, right? So you can have tooling, like graphical, that knows about the entire schema and how it is, how it is built, how it is structured. So you get type aheads uh, if you want. You can, you can have uh, IDE integrations that enable you to do uh, syntax checks inside of the IDE and, and maybe checks also whether uh, the fields that you are you know, uh, editing in your query string are actually available and all of these things. So this is really powerful. It allows you to generate documentation for your entire schema. Um, right, so <laughs> I've talked about all of this. And I find it important to stress that I think it's not a replacement of REST. It's not something that uh, replaces the concept of REST as a, as a whole. It's just an involvement of um, our way of, of how we think about HTTP APIs and what's, uh, what's available to us as a tool, right? So this is just an additional tool for, for very specific um, uh, problems. So if you have a complex client-side application that has complex data requirements, why don't you give GraphQL a try? Um, for, for well, generic standardized API, you will probably still want to go with REST. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's problem specific. And the way that I like to think about GraphQL is that it changes somehow the client-server relationship, right? So with REST, somehow the server dictates what everything is going to look like, and the client then only can, you know, fetch specific uh, information in a way that the server tells the client to, to consume it. And with GraphQL, the client specifies the requirements because, after all, the client knows best what it needs and what it wants to render, and the server publishes its possibilities. Um, if you want to learn more about GraphQL syntax, there's three different, or GraphQL as, as a whole, the whole specification, if you will, um, there's three different ways of uh, getting that knowledge. So first of all, there is, um, uh, a lot of different demo applications on the web. Um, uh, this is probably the most famous one. It's by one of the core developers of GraphQL. Um, and it's uh, this graphical interface running on the Star Wars API. And uh, if you look at the source code of that one, it's also on GitHub. Uh, you can see that it's basically making REST calls underneath. So the Node.js server that hosts this thing is basically still sending out REST calls. But for you, as the consumer of the, of the, of the API, you're just doing the GraphQL queries. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, do the tutorials, there's also a nice learngraphql.com website where you can uh, get guided through the whole process and all of the syntax things. And if you're really brave, there's also the full specification, the RFC um, in text format. It's really long, um, but it's really informative, and it's also very well written, so I can recommend that too. 
Um, so far, we have only seen one small feature, well, the main feature, but uh, one part of GovCal. We've only seen querying, basic querying, basic fetching of nested information. But there's much, 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 much more in GraphQL, much more to the syntax than you saw so far. Uh, we have got fragments. Fragments are like mixins, if you know what I mean, traits, so to speak, right? So you can make them, make reusable parts of your queries. We have mutations, write operations. Uh, we have got aliasing, so you can customize the structure of the response, and a lot of additional features. We'll look at some of those in the extended demo that's, uh, that I'm going to do next. Um, um, and there's also other things on top of GraphQL, um, namely Relay, which would have been part of the workshop, and something that we will look at in the buff, um, depending on how many people will come. So, yeah. Let's see these additional features in action. Yeah, uh, actually, that's not a bad idea. Very creative. Um, yeah, you can you can just do whatever you want on this machine. Just, I think I just need to log in and call you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll just continue with this demo here in the meantime on this laptop, right? All right. <coughs> you can also oh, you, yeah, you, you can switch this later, right? Um, you can take away the mouse. Yes. Okay, so. Um, more complicated features or more advanced features. So, um, maybe to visualize the whole concept of arbitrary code and invoking functions. Um, so, as we saw before, if order, in order to get a list of things, you can do this thing, for example. And, right, so. As you can see, this is the introspection, basically also giving you the descriptions. You can fetch IDs, etc. And what's important is, you can now, after running this query, you can see, okay, episode ID 4 is a new hope. So you can say, okay, give me a specific film. Now we can see this is actually a function call, right? So because we have arguments, whoa. So I can say, okay, give me ID And for that, give me the title again. So if we execute this, a new hope, right. Um, if we're looking at Drupal later on, this would basically be the, the, the um, equivalence to doing entity queries. And this would be single load, right. Um, so, right, we can do multiple root calls in the same query. We can tell it give me all of the films, but also give me all of the people in the same request. It's just one HTTP request that we're making here, right? So that's really powerful already. Um, and variables, you might want to be able to reuse them. So let's make that possible. We can name our query. And we can say, okay, so there's this ID argument to this query. And it is of type ID. And can you reuse that here? It's a required value of type ID. So this is the type system in action that you can see here. And then I can say, in, in the variables that I'm passing to the server, I can say, OK, so ID is this one. And when I execute the query now again, it's still the same. It works still, right? And then we have aliasing. So you can say, OK, so fetch one is this. And why is it required? Because I want to do another call on film two. So I call the same, the same root call field on this, on this schema, the same argument. And maybe here I want to fetch something else, so the director of the film. And then our response is shaped in the way that we want it to be shaped. To be shaped. So this is aliasing. Um, we have got reference, ref references. So on the schema, basically, we have a list field that says, OK, 
there's a connection to another data type called species. So all other species that are available in that particular movie, that, that appear in that particular movie, and the object in there is of type species. So now we can follow references. Imagine Drupal, you have a node, you have an author of that node, you want to fetch information about the user, not just the user ID, but also like the username, email address, password. Um, you can do that. Yeah, that's no problem. Well, that just works naturally too. <coughs> and because we have a type system, we can also do um, how do you, how do you call it? We can we can basically um, do type specific field fetching. So let me show you what that means. So first of all, let's take a look at fragments. Fragments are a way of crafting reusable query pieces. So this is my test fragment. On species, so for the type species, I want to make this reusable trait, if you speak of PHP, that I can drop into any of the queries, and I can say, okay, so for this reusable piece, I want to always fetch the title, and maybe eye color, whatever. Oh, name, obviously. So, yeah, you see, you get errors when something is incorrect. And now I can say, okay, yeah. drop this in here, and, right, so if I had multiple queries that want to fetch information about species, I could just do it like this. Why is this also important? Because there's generic entry points. So imagine you want to fetch a Drupal node. You don't know what bundle that node is going to be. So you don't know which configured fields will be available, right? And also the schema doesn't know it. So if we are fetching a node of type, uh, if a node with ID 1, we will not have access to the title field because it's not, we don't know which bundle and if the bundle even has a title field, right? So what we do is, and I can also visualize that here. Um, there's a generic node entry point. I can fetch any object that is uh, available. Um, let me just clean up here a little bit. So any object that is available um, on the server can be fetched with a unique identifier across the whole application. Um, this is this ID string, right? You see it here. It's basically a base 64 encoded string containing information about the type of the object and the ID. Very simple, very clever. So, generic entry point, node. We don't know what type of object is going to be loaded. So right now, we don't have any information that we can fetch in here except for the ID. So that's really not helpful. So what we do is, we can say, if the object that is going to be returned is of type film, give me the title. It's of type film. So we get the title. I can kind of make this make, make use of this by doing that multiple times, <coughs> and then based on the ID I provide down here, it will fetch different things. So let's get uh, the species first, so we can show that as well. Oh, we need the ID, obviously. So if I now change this ID to this, it gives us the name property because it knows it's a species. These features are so important because they enable a whole lot of different um, very powerful features on your server. So what you can do right now is um, if you are going into production mode and you don't want to expose the full schema anymore for the entire GraphQL type system that, you have on, that, your, that your server can potentially provide, you could generate routes. Say um, you have JavaScript client code that has a whole range of different queries that want to fetch films. 
So you add a build task to your JavaScript code, which extracts all of the queries that, the JavaScript, that, that are inside of your JavaScript code and generates a PHP route in Drupal, right, for example, that knows, OK, so um, the arguments inside of these queries um, is ID, right? So um, I, I configure the route to be uh, um, Drupal slash GraphQL slash um, films slash placeholder ID. And then I copy the query string from the JavaScript code into the Drupal code, into the PHP code. And on the server, I basically run that query, but without exposing the entire schema to the client. So you get full freedom in your client-side application while you're developing. And then you compile your code. And the, pr pr the, the thing that it produces is basically a locked down GraphQL schema where only the queries that you're specifying are available. But they are nowhere to be found inside of your JavaScript code, because in your JavaScript code, they're just calling, making an HTTP request to that one particular route. Um, that's very powerful. Also, if you have a large application like Facebook, these query strings actually become quite long. So there's, for the news feed on facebook.com, the query string is like 1,000 lines long. And uh, um, you don't want to send that over the wire because then it would like, invalidate the whole benefit of not having overfetching, right? If you're sending one megabyte of query parameters. Um, so you store the query on the server, and that's how it works. I'm kind of... Um, <laughs> nice, so that's really cool. Um, there's more features, right? So um, there's bonus material for, for uh, regarding Relay, GraphQL Relay. Um, we can do that at the end if there's time. But let's look at Drupal first now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, spoiler. Yeah, how do we do this? So it, no, this is Joseph's account. You have to send it to Joseph. Okay. <laughs> okay. Doesn't matter because we have one more cool feature that we can can, can look at. So I talked about introspection, um, publishing the type system, publishing the schema that the server provides, <laughs> right? And there's this word that I phrased that I used before: introspection. Um, you can, so GraphQL has this very interesting notion of publishing the schema through graph, the, the GraphQL schema through GraphQL. So you can use a GraphQL query to fetch, to, to recursively fetch the types, the type information for your entire schema. Um, and this, this works through a very uh, cool underscore prefixed entry point here. You can say, okay, access the entire schema. For every type in this schema, give me the name, or well, the kind, uh, description. And then further, if this is an object, it, it further to send in the fields, again, <coughs> give me the type of the field, the name, the kind, the description, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And then you see, OK, so um, this is the entire type graph. And you can use that to generate documentation. You can use that to validate your code on the client side. You can use that to have IDE features. Um, right, so let's try it out. I'm sorry for all the inconvenience. I'm kind of. <laughs> yeah, right, we can do questions in the meantime. So may I ask, how would you tackle the versioning in this track? Right. Um, so the question was, how does this solve versioning? Um, because I like, boldly claimed that it does. Um, there's a specific property on each of the types in your type system, um, namely, is deprecated, right? And if you flag a field as deprecated, it will no longer appear in introspection. Introspection doesn't show it anymore. It's no longer publicized, but it still works, and because and, and, and the very specific question that you had about how it solves the versioning of the API calls, basically, is, well, it, run, it runs on arbitrary code. 
So if you upgrade your underlying systems, or if you, if you want to um, um, uh, make a new version of your API available, you basically add new fields, mark the old fields as deprecated, um, and the new fields would then run on the modern code, on the new code inside of your application, and the old one, the old code, uh, you would just basically write PHP code that somehow had the, P the BC, will, there would be like a BC layer in your function code. So you'd, you'd uh, leave this field in there and maybe like map to the old code, right? So, you know what I mean? Yeah, but um, would you be able to see if this deprecated uh, field, for example, gets called? Yes. Still get called? Interesting question. Um, so because, Again, it, it's, it just runs on arbitrary code, um, and you can uh, name all of the queries. So, um, did you see before when I said query, name of the query, and then the variable defin definitions in that? You can basically lock that, right? So you know what name, what, what query names are being sent to the server, first of all, right? And if you want to know the specific fields <coughs> that are being called, you would basically just, uh, uh, in, your, in your resolver functions, make a watchdog uh, call, right? Something like that. And then you know if it's still being used. So if you are deprecating something, <laughs> if you're deprecating something in the resolver function, at that, at that point, you would add a watchdog invocation to that resolver function, and then after two years, you can check, hey, is that, is that still in my logs? If not, you just remove it. Cool. Any other questions until we're done here? The Star Wars API we, sh we looked at before? Yeah, nope. The, um, uh, this is now using the Star Wars API. It's just a public REST API that you can use to demo um, HTTP APIs. So but the Drupal not, module. It's not the Drupal now, this is a Drupal module now. See, this is a Drupal environment. See, this is graphical instead of Drupal. Um, so that, so we were going to demo that now, uh, okay. if it works. Um, so. Before it wasn't, but this is now going to be a demo about Drupal and how it works in Drupal. Huh? Right, we just have to increase the size and then it's... Right, thanks. Thank you. Claudio. <laughs> Damn it. Why does Drupal 8 have to be responsive? Um, okay, I think this is kind of okay. <coughs> Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I love Drupal 8. Uh, okay. Um, Drupal. So now you spoiled this a little bit because the query is already in here. Um, right. So there is a Drupal GraphQL module which is still in the works. There is a published version uh, which has some limited features and they, they work, but it's not read, not fully done yet. And what it does is it allows you to run queries against entity query, so for listings. It allows you to run, run queries through views, so um, you can specify further exposed filters and make like custom configuration for your views. And it allows you to fetch single entries. So let's do that first. Um, actually, let's do the list first. So node query, no, let's do one single one first. Node ID one. So we, again, we have this thing where you can specify um, arguments to the function. And then we get, OK, a node obviously has a node ID. So let's see that, take a look at that. So we have one node with ID 1, obviously. And we can fetch the title. And we can fetch Oh, let's, let's, let's leave it at that. For now. So this is article one, and to show you that I'm not faking this, there's node, uh, there's security updates, but there's node article one down here. So it's just a node that I've created before this presentation. And now it gets interesting. So you want to fetch the user. So you go into this, and then you say, okay, give me the name of that user. That works. Give me the email address of that user. That works. Give me the configured language object for that user. And 
from that object give me the direction of the language, LTR or RTL. Um, so this is trying to kind of expose the entire type data graph of Drupal through um, a GraphQL schema. Um, and All that discovery on the left-hand side, left side is dynamic? Yeah, this is from completely dynamic. Like It iterates the type data definitions of your Drupal 8 environment. Any entity type is in here. So we have user, maybe let's just look at it. Blog, comment, contact, file, node, shortcut, everything. So this is just iterating on the type data definitions. Um, um, right, and, and it tries to simplify that a little bit. Um, yeah. So now we have the problem. There's a body field on article, right? But I can't query that. There's no body field. And that's because it is only available to article and page. Oh, God. So we have to go um, on entity node article. This is an article. Give me the, now we have it. Give me the body. And from the body, give me the unprocessed the, the value. Yes. OK? And then that also works. Um, right. Listings. Type data exposes information about whether or not a field is queryable, so if it is something that is computed or something that is stored in the database. So when we run entity query, we get access to all of the different configured things that are stored in the database. So I can say, OK, give me all of, uh, give me uh, the nodes with R, called article 1. And that still works. Or if I leave that out, basically it gives me every node in the system. Um, and then if it is a page, give me the body value. And if it is an article, give me the user name. So that's quite powerful, actually. Uh, you want to see anything else about? <laughs> right. The type. Yeah. Oh, this is not, this is uh, like, the, you can only fetch the target ID. Oh, right. Because, con right, config entities are not supported yet. Oh, I'm trying to not tell you the things that it can't do. Sorry? Oh, yeah, access control. Um, interesting question. Uh, this is actually the question that always, that's always being asked, and I have not added a slide for that yet. Access control works through Drupal access restrictions. So if you have, Entities, you have entity access. If you have fields, you have field access. Um, there's an interface on every object that supports it called accessible interface. If that interface is there, I invoke the access method. If access is restricted, that part of the query is just removed from the response, but the query itself is still executed. And that allows you to have client side coach. <coughs> Client side code, a, a gigantic query with additional information for administrators, people with administration permission. If it's not in the response, you know, it doesn't, the user doesn't have permission to, to, to get that information. If it is in the response and it's empty or whatever, then you know there's nothing in there. So you can kind of like branch your display in the front end based on that. Okay, but how do you authenticate a user then? So if I'm running. Drupal. No, but uh, on the client side. Yeah, Drupal. Well, that's not job at the job of the module. So the module provides you with um, um, authentication or auth-based access checks, right? But how you authenticate your, your users is, de is dependent on which auth provider you use. So auth providers in Drupal 8 are pluggable. By default, we have like standard auth and cookie auth and all of these things, right? But you can add OAuth, you can add uh, whatever. So this is something that another module would provide, or your custom code would provide, like up to you. And then that basically sets the user, the global user context, and then based on that, we do our thing. Uh, view mode. So if I uh, have different view modes and uh, for fields, I uh, selected something like for the body uh, trim version. 
Yeah. So this, uh, the view modes are based, so the question was, how does this work with view modes? So view modes are really only uh, relevant for getting rendered output, right? So it's nothing like that affects the properties that are available in any way. But um, you can actually fetch the rendered output for an entity, so it have PHP render it, and you can specify the view mode. And it's like an enum that allows you to specify all of the different, like here you can see, theme debug, sorry. So debug mode is on. But you can specify that, um, and yeah. Um, I don't know when you would want to do that, though. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So you mean when you so the question was how does this look for responsive images? You mean in terms of fetching the data for the images or the rendered output? Because the rendered output is going to be the same. Okay. So rendered output is just the same. It just runs the Drupal renderer and returns the string. Um, actually, I think let's let's move on because I have like two more three, two or three more slides and then we have a lot of time for questions. Um, actually, we don't because it's over already. But. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you know what? Because otherwise, I'd have to plug it all. I'm so sorry for all the inconvenience, right, with all the laptops. But I would have to change the laptops again now. So let's continue with questions. Basically, the last slide would be what the modules can't, can't, can't yet. So there's no relay support yet. I'm trying to add that. I'm going to replace the underlying PHP library of the module, because right now, this is running on the uh, PHP parser and Lexa that I wrote myself but I don't have time to maintain it, and there's p other people writing other libraries which are also really good, so I'm going to switch to something that is more maintained. Um, it's kind of sad because I've spent a lot of time on writing that, but uh, um, right, uh, it's just a necessary thing to do in order to support Relay and all of these things that I can't add. I don't have time for that. So I'll, I'll work on the module and le let the library, the hard stuff, be done by some other people. Um, we will add pagination support. Um, pagination is really interesting in, in Relay. Um, I'll, this, is, this is something that is, I, I recommend everyone to check out because this is so cool and it's so clever so, uh, soft in, in Relay. Uh, we'll look at that in the buff afterwards. Um, um, and uh, we'll solve some of the caching issues. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. And mutation, so write support is also really interesting on GraphQL. We'll also, I'll also show how write works. Uh, also in the buff after this. Um, right, so questions. Yeah. So the question was, how do you translate fields? So generally, we choose um, the language of the user, right? So the, the, because you have an auth context when you, when you do authentication, and at that point, all of the data that you're fetching is based on the active user. Um, what you can do is, uh, you can basically expose a language argument on every resolver function I'm not sure yet if we want that. Um, or we could make it even so that when you specify a language object on any of the, the fields, at that point, all of the fields nested beneath that point know about that context and keep the language active. So um, inside of that subtree, then, the language would stay that same. Um, this is open for discussion, and uh, it's not implemented right now. So we always respond with the language of the user. But it should be, it's trivial to add a field argument, a function argument to each of those. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what type of endpoint um, um, can re uh, receives that query? It's just so you see here. This is graph. Oh, you don't see that, but it's <laughs> GraphQL slash Explorer for the graphical interface, and just GraphQL is for the query. So this sends the query to slash GraphQL, and it, you can send it as a get parameter, um, or you can send it as a as a, a, a body value query, and then variables. Um, um, Maybe there's actually a question. So I said you, you would send it as a get parameter. Maybe people will have a question about that. Hint, hint. Um, write operations through get, mm. right? Um, is there a question about that? <laughs> yeah, you can. So uh, you can write through get. This is quite uncommon. Um, but what is, is there actually an argument against it? Well, you'd say, OK, so 
get through post is quite bad because HTTP caching is gone, right? Um, you can actually solve that by using get, but then you have like the max limit of get, get size, right? And all these problems. Um, it is kind of mitigated by the fact that this is very efficient already. So do you need clients that get caches? Hmm. But even then, in, the, in this modern world, you can solve the caches um, still. And, and actually, you can, you can make HTTP post caching possible. This is kind of, it's like, if you Google that, it's actually, there's actually ways to make that possible. So, yeah, um, right, other questions? How do you, how do you well, let's, let's uh, I have some other people first, but then we can come back to you. So if you're currently you have a REST API exposed from another company, you're yep. you build this on top of that? Yeah. So the question is, when you already have a REST API, so actually the, you can make two questions of that. So if you already have a REST API, how do you upgrade to GraphQL? And then the second question, can you, uh, implement other REST APIs in GraphQL. So, function calls. So, uh, let me ask the sec answer the second question first. Um, if you have a remote API like Facebook, Twitter, whatever, you can create a schema in your GraphQL implementation and make the, the Facebook API calls through the same schema, so the same query. So, maybe you have a field on your user account, on your user profile, which contains the Facebook user ID of that particular person and you want to fetch the Facebook posts for them. So why don't you create a resolver function that for that user ID calls Facebook API and returns that information? One query, a remote API call is made on the server, very efficient, you can even cache that on the server, right? So actually that's, that's uh, something that I li really like about um, GraphQL. Um, and then the question is, if you already have a REST API, how do you upgrade? Two different solutions to that problem. Um, the Star Wars API actually is an implementation of exactly that. So the Star Wars API we looked at before is built around an existing Star Wars REST API. So it, it's basically making REST calls in the resolver functions. So if you have like um, DevOps people in your team going like, um, well, you say, okay, let's, let's move Graph to GraphQL and say like, meh, nah, let's not do it. And then you can just implement it on your own, right? So you set up a Node.js server. Um, and uh, you call your backend APIs, the REST, REST APIs, just to normal REST module, whatever. And then in your front-end code, you just switch it out. And then after one year, you tell them, hey, actually, we're we already using GraphQL, so let's, not, let's move to that in the backend. Um, that's how you upgrade. That's how you can make an intermediate upgrade step. Um, so other questions? Can you query on fields or This is a very good question, um, because on the node, query thing, we don't, we only have the things that are available to all node types. Yeah, but I'm thinking if you put a node type, is it bundled? Can you then maybe infer that you know what the field will be? Nope. Uh, this is a limitation, but for that, we have views as a solution. So you can configure a view where you have an exposed filter and the view is already like limited on articles. Then you can have the exposed filter in view show up in these arguments. Um, we have view support, so I didn't show that yet. So there's a configured view right now already. Um, or is there? No, there is not. Uh, well. Actually, you will have to trust me on this because we don't have much time left. But there's a view, and you can, there's a special views plugin called GraphQL Display, and then you. Yeah. In views, you mean? No, no, oh, right, so um, the question was basically, aren't you then overfetching on the server and just filtering on the server? Um, the, way, the, the way views works, it's the same. You, do, you don't configure fields in your views. The display does not support fields. It only supports you configuring exposed filters and contextual arguments. So this is like rendered, rendered entity display, kind of, right? So instead of rendering the entire entity, I'm just running, uh, I'm just fetching the IDs of each of the entities, and GraphQL does the loading of the actual data. So views doesn't do anything. It's just, views is just configuring the entry point. 
Um, right. Other questions? Are we done? Two minutes over time. Minus 10 minutes for starting late um, and the interruptions. Right. Right. So then uh, let's close this. Thanks for your time. I would, just, I would have loved to show you the slides, but yeah. <laughs> thanks. Um, oh, I don't have a slide for that right now, but thanks to the sponsors. Um, it's kind of, kind of unfortunate that they are like locked in their own room, away from everyone else, but yeah. But yeah, thanks. It's uh, amazing. Um, so I guess like let's grab food, everyone, and then whoever is interested in Relay and the client side, uh, React maybe, Relay, um, server-side rendering, and all of these things. Let's meet in like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You can also come later, it doesn't matter. Like, let's meet there in that other room. <laughs>